It might have helped if I had the audio going for that. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Let's Read, a series where I, your host, Remy McNeil of Celtic Phoenix Productions, read a book live on stream for all to enjoy. Ah... <sighs> For those who are new to the channel, welcome. For those who are also here on the channel but have been here for a while, you might be wondering why I have put on quite a facade with this British accent. Well, that is because uh, I'm trying to be fancy with my new ascot, as I motioned to mutely not just a few seconds ago. Uh, so, welcome, one and all. Uh, today is a very special day because we finally have... The first ever Ruby novel, which is a position that I had hoped to take back when I first started my channel. Now, I never got around to actually, uh, well, I did put my application in for a lot of things. But, I never actually got around to being that one, unfortunately. However, we have here a work uh, with the story by Kerry Shawcross and Miles Luna, but written by E.C. Myers, who is someone who I have no familiarity with whatsoever. So, with that said, I would rather dive right into this, and, um, well, let, let, let's start off here. The cover is actually, well, it's kind of a mixed quality, mixed bag. First of all, the art on here is absolutely ridiculous. It's, it hasn't aged at all well, um, and it, it's, I mean, there's still some really bad things going on with this, aside, you know, you've got... The weird eye thing going on with Velvet here, uh, I'm trying to show you. You got the fact that you have the stock photos of Team Ruby in in Coco's reflections. Um, and overall, it's just a generic pose for the entire team. It doesn't tell me anything about the book. It has the stock image of Ruby from Volume 4 on here. I, I don't understand. Um, now... Other so one positive, it has a very nice, sleek, and kind of reflective glow to it. It's very hard to show on stream, with the exception of like down here, it's a little bit matte, and here as well, it's also matte, and I don't know why. Uh, yes, Entryon, I am also interested to know if this book is good. Let us start this by reading the back of the book. <clears throat> After Beacon Academy fell, Coco, Fox, Velvet, and Yatsuhashi made a vow. No one else is getting left behind. Who got left behind? It's been more than a year since Team Coffee saw their school destroyed by the creatures of Grimm. The friends failed in battle or scattered, scattered across the world of Remnant. Since then, they've been settling into a life at Shade Academy in Vacuo, fighting hard to finish their training so they can find their friends and save their world. When a distress message comes into Shade asking for huntsmen and huntresses to defend refugees from a never-ending stream of Grimm, Team Coffee answers the call without hesitation. But in the heat of the desert, they're forced to relive their former battles, both from the fall of Beacon and from everything that came before. Don't miss this exclusive story straight from award-winning author E.C. Myers and Ruby's head writers Carrie Shawcross and Mars Luna. Copyright Rose Teeth Productions, LLC, 2019. So, <clears throat> there's mention of refugees in here. Oh, that's going to be spicy, isn't it? I get the feeling it's going to be spicy. Well, let's see. <clears throat> yes, yes, please, please share this around. Make sure every way, you know, you, you, every which way people can... Um, can can see it. I would I would love to have more people on the stream. Uh, okay, so let's so. So if for those of you who heard of the last let's uh, let's read, which was a while back, it was with Resident Evil's uh, City of the Damned or Dead City of the Dead. Sorry, um, this is actually a comparatively different type of novel setup, and I thought it was very interesting. The prose. I have not actually read the prose, but the actual spacing of the words is much much wider. Uh, the, the book pages are bigger, the font is larger. So, and I'm also currently reading Saga of Tanya the Evil's, uh, second novel, uh, which I believe is, uh, Deus Vault, or is it, um, oh, it's not Deus Vault. Deus Vault, I think it's the first one. Um, that said, 
So it might be a faster read. I was managing about 60 pages for the Resident Evil novel. And I hope to go two hours today, like I usually did with those. So I'm wondering how far I can make it with this one. And it's going to be very interesting. So um, shall we start off? And I'll, you'll slight note, I actually really like this. It's a very nice touch having the outlines of the characters on the inside. That is actually a very nice touch. I like it when books kind of do that with the kind of stylizing their, their novel sizes, uh, their, their novel pages. Uh, it doesn't look like there's much else of that in here. Uh, aside from just the chapter titles. Um, oh, it's Deus Tovolt, and I think that would be the first novel in the series. All right, well, <clears throat> let's get on it, shall we? Um, now, do note, I shall keep an eye out for Super Chats and the like. If you want to donate to the stream, I have a link to the Streamlabs down below. Um, and I will shout out uh, Streamlabs and the like as they come in. So, thank you all so much for joining me. Let's begin! <clears throat> Velvet Scarlatina's least favorite thing about Vacuo was how it tasted. Oh, oh <laughs> we're starting off good here. Of course, Vacuo didn't have much going for it unless you enjoy blistering heat, scarce food, and scarcer water. Do you like getting lost? Then come to Vacuo, where the desert landscape completely changes overnight. Or even from one hour to the next. The most popular items of tourist gift shops were t-shirts that read Vacuo, the wrong place at the wrong time, and a terrible place to visit, but you wouldn't want to live here, uh, a terrible place to vi visit, but you wouldn't want to live there. Of all things included, uh, of all the things included in Velvet's mental list of cons about Vacuo, number one was the lack of anything to include under prose. Number two, the way the sand kept getting in her mouth, even when it was covered with a, t uh, a pithy t-shirt. Uh, Chewing fresh cactus leaf helped neutralize the sand's bitter flavor, but all the luxuries uh, were hard to come by. In, uh, were hard to come by in Vacuo. Used to living with hardship, uh, Vacuans simply factored the sand into their food preparation. And hey, if you couldn't deal with the local spice, you probably didn't belong there. I don't think it's healthy to eat food, regardless. Uh, he, not food. You can you can eat food, but I don't think it's healthy to eat sand. God knows that Anakin Skywalker must love it there. Um. Velvet definitely didn't belong to Vacuo. She was supposed to be in Vale, beautiful, cool, green Vale. She was supposed to be trained at Beacon Academy, uh, Beacon Academy, to become a huntress to protect people. But Beacon was even less hospitable than the desert, uh, the desert these days, as hard as that was to believe. Instead, she and her team, Coco Adele, Fox Alistar, uh, Coco Adele, Fox Alistar, and Yatsu Hasudaichi, known collectively to their school, their schoolmates as Team Coffee had made their way to Vacuo more than a year ago to finish off their training at Shade Academy. Uh, and they had more important things to worry about than the taste of sand. What are these? Um, what are these things? I can't do an Australian accent. I'm going to try, but I can't. What are these things? Velvet shouted, ducking as a massive crab-like creature thrust its claw at her head. The pincer snapped shut loudly right between her uh, long rabbit ears. That was too close, she thought. I hate to end up as a split-hair pun. Uh, as a split hair pun. Especially after everything else she had survived. Uh, the natural wildlife roaming vacuo was tough for sure, but as a huntress in training, Velvet had seen real monsters lurking in the darkness. Using his semblance, a special ability unique to every warrior in the world of Remnant, Fox answered her question telepathically via their special tr uh, team speak. Mole, cr Mole crabs, he said. Kind of small for the species. S uh, small, huh? Maybe they're babies, Coco said. They sure fight like babies. So wait, are these are these grim? Or are these, like, random wildlife? I actually like that. Okay, all right, all right. You're doing actually what I suggested. Uh, to her left, Velvet heard uh, rapid shots from Coco's Gatling gun. The explosive, uh, the explosive impact of her aura-enhanced bullets onto, the crab, uh, onto a crab's carapace. And soon the sound of a shell cracking and crumbling. The creature screeched horribly as it died. But Velvet's crab was still very much alive and frisky. It lunged for her again. She dove and rolled out, rolled out of the way. She just needed her camera. Suddenly, Yatsuhashi was by her side, as always. The large crab didn't look quite as intimidating next to Yatsu, who was a foot and a half taller than Velvet and much broader. Uh, the large crab... Oh, sorry, the creature chittered nervously. 
Yatsu grabbed its claws with both hands, holding it closed. Then he twisted it, uh, his torso and tossed the creature up and away, uh, and away with a roar. It spun through the air like an oversized discus with spindly legs until it crashed into a dune 50 feet away. There it lay, stunned, half, uh, stunned, half buried in sand. Hey, that one was mine, Velvet said. You're welcome. Give me a hand. He nodded to another nearby crab, which uh, had also flipped onto its back. It's like twitching frequently, uh, frantically in the air as it struggled to right itself. Oh, Centrion. Uh, what would it take to persuade you to read the Dishonored books? Uh, I don't know. I've been, I, I, I haven't really looked into the Dishonored books. Yeah, how's this? I will read Super Chats at every chapter break. Does that, I think that's agreeable to everyone so it doesn't interrupt the flow of the, the books because I don't want to keep answering Super Chats. If you give me a $20 donation, I will answer it immediately, at least as, as soon as I see it on the screen. But uh, I, I, for anything less than that, I think it's better to kind of bulk them. Okay, so. Uh, uh, where was I? Velvet approached the overturned crab, getting close enough to see her, uh, her face reflected in its beady black eyes, each of, uh, each the size of her head. She looked away, almost feeling sorry for it. She turned to face Yatsu, knelt on one knee, and interlaced her fingers. Yatsu sprinted towards her, drawing his great sword from behind his back. As he stepped into the link, uh, her linked hands, she heaved upwards and stood boosting his jump so that he catapulted high over her head. She spun around and watched him fall towards the crab, sword pointed downward purposefully. The blade pierced the mole crab's soft underbelly. The crab need uh the crab keened keened the crab keened and thrashed, but uh but Yatsu someone just messaged me on Facebook, uh but Yatsu held onto a sword and stayed on top. He plunged the blade in deeper. Uh, not that. I need to open this. No, open. I need the mute Facebook. Or not. I don't know what that ping was. Okay. <clears throat> uh, clear liquid gushed from the wound um, and drenched him. Ew, Velvet thought. The crab's death throw sent a sand flying everywhere, including right uh, into Velvet's eyes, and of course, her open mouth. She coughed and rubbed her stinging eyes until she could see again. Did she have a t-shirt open her, over her mouth? Didn't she say that? The crab's body still twitched, but it was clearly no longer a threat. Yatsu jumped down and walked towards Velvet. His green robe was soaked in dark, almost uh, was soaked almost dark, uh, was soaked dark, almost black. She backed away from him, covering her nose. I uh, think it's just water. Yatsu swept his finger through his short, damp hair and then examined his hand. Stinky water, you smell like a swamp, she said. That's suddenly very British for you, for Velvet. I know, he said sadly. The liquid was already evaporating into the hot afternoon sun, and the stench, uh, but the stench remained. Yatsu wiped his eyes and looked around. How are we doing? Velvet assessed the battlefield with him. Fox was dancing just within reach of his crab, the smallest of the group. It had only one claw, the other jutted out of the sand beside him, neatly severed. Whenever the crab snapped its remaining claw at the lithe, red-haired teen, Fox dodged and slashed the limb with his uh, bladed tonfas. At least Fox is having fun, Velvet said. Uh, Coco walked calmly towards Velvet and Yatsu, <clears throat> the shredded remains of a crab behind her. She managed to avoid getting any of its guts and gore on her brown and black ensemble. Lucky thing, because Vacuo wasn't big on designer clothing, though Coco's beret and aviator sunglasses were gaining popularity among Shades Academy students as a fashionable and surprisingly functional desert wear. Uh, Coco folded her gun up. So they wouldn't have been wearing shades? I guess aviators are slightly different. I don't know how the beret would have been functional. Um, Coco folded her gun up into the handbag and slung its ban uh, bandolier strap over her shoulder. She flashed a thumbs up. Mission accomplished. As Velvet returned the gesture, she abruptly remembered that the crab Yatsu had tossed into the dune. She looked for it, but the mound of sand it had landed in was gone, and so was the crab. Good, she thought, followed almost immediately by, Oh no. She watched the sand in front of Coco uh, geysered, and Velvet lost sight of their leader. Coco! Velvet bolted uh, towards her, Yatsu right on her heels. Fox, stop playing around, Yatsu called. Coming, Fox sent. So I guess Fox is mute. Well, that's going to be different for fixing Ruby. Uh, 
Velvet glanced over uh, as Fox lopped off the crab's head with his own dismembered uh, with its own dismembered claw. He dropped the limb and darted towards uh, Coco, who was struggling in the, uh, the claw grip of the last small crab. She strained to keep the pincers from closing around her. Velvet stopped and uh, reached behind her for the rectangular brown box she always carried on her belt. She pressed the Stitch Heart's emblem and opened it. Uh, Stitch Heart emblem to open it and then removed uh, an Isadora, her high-tech camera that she that used special dust an energy propellant substance to print photographed weapons in hard light. Wow, this is... Okay, first... Oh, we're getting to a break here. I'll explain in a minute. Combined with her semblance, photographic memory, Velvet could wield 3D replicas with skills and moves that otherwise would have taken years of training to master. Yatsu sped past Velvet, and soon he was engaging the crab. But he couldn't get close enough to hack away at its claws like Fox had. This one was too fast. It was all Yatsu could do to parry the attacks from the other claws with his sword. Velvet thumbed through the images stored in the camera, looking uh, for just the right one to help her friends. Professor Port's blunderbuss raised and aimed. Uh, Professor Port blunderbuss raised and aimed at a uh, at a flock of griffins in the Amity Arena. Weishni, in a rare unguarded moment, with a giant glowing arm and sword hanging from a glyph floating behind her. Green-haired Reese Chloris leaning on her hoverboard after she and the rest of Team Auburn had defeated a Deathstalker. Velvet came across the last snapshot she'd taken of her friend Ruby Rose and her high-caliber uh, sniper, uh, sniper scythe, Crescent Rose, the perfect weapon for cracking open crab skulls. Uh, for oh, cracking open a crab, still Velvet hesitated, hand, uh, hand trembling at the memory as the memories flooded back. All right, so I'm gonna pause here for a moment. Um, Overly descriptive when it comes down to the details of the world. You're throwing a lot at a reader from the get-go, assuming they have. This is this is this is assuming that someone hasn't in interacted with Ruby before. You're throwing a lot at them and then immediately describing it in detail without allowing them to really breathe and focus on what's going on. You're talking about semblance. You're talking about dust. You're talking about uh, uh, these specialized weapons. You're talking about these creatures that, again, I don't think they've been identified as 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 crabs or not. As just like my crabs, as um, they're crabs, but we don't know whether or not they are um. We don't know whether or not they're grim or not, so and like introducing the idea of grim has already been established. You're throwing like the entire lore of Ruby down someone's throat over the span of six pages, less than that. Um. So it's it's. Oh, and Isadora. That, that's where I've heard that before. Okay, that's a clever reference. I actually like that for her weapon name. And actually, I think we'll keep that for the Fixing Ruby because that makes sense. Uh, um, so we'll just go with that. But you're throwing a lot at people and you're going to overwhelm them. And I understand you want to start with an action sequence, but this is the wrong way to do it where you're throwing everything at them. Assuming Ruby... Hey, you never know. I got into... Oops. I got into Halo because of the novels. So, like, you never know how you're going to catch a new reader. You gotta you gotta both assume that someone is familiar and not familiar, and that's a very fine line to straddle. Really? He's blind, not mute, but he's using telepathy primarily. Uh, they're in a doctor's clinic fighting another type of crabs. Let's not go there right now. All right, so to this flashback, it's all, in, it's all in italicized. So I guess I should try um, her Australian accent for this whole thing, but nah. Beacon was burning. Beacon was falling all around them. Oh, actually, before we begin that, I also want to make a note here. Um, okay, so Port aiming at Griffins. I don't remember her taking a picture of that, but fine. Uh, that's, that, that's a moment that happened. Uh, taking a picture of Weiss with the glyph, fine. But Reese Chloris uh, fighting a Deathstalker? I don't remember that happening. Um, and I just reviewed a lot of Volume 3's footage. So maybe there's something I missed there. Maybe it's just something that's supposed to happen off screen, but that's kind of... Beacon was burning. Beacon was falling. All around them. My fair lady. Wait, no, that, that isn't part of it. And they couldn't save it. The sky was full of wings and cries of griffins, terrible flying grim monsters that had carried off several classmates and tourists. Rest in peace, Roy Stallion. But he was carried off by a uh, Nevermore. Uh, shattering the peace of the festival. 
Other creatures of Grimm, Beowulfs, creeps, Borba tusks, rampaged through the rubble-littered streets as people uh, ran screaming. The clang and clatter of the battle echoed throughout the city, struggling to be heard over the softer sounds of the now, uh, the now haunted Velvet's dreams. At least the military's hacked defense robots had been deactivated. Now all Coffee had to deal with was the Grimm. Um, but the Grimm were relentless and vicious, and there were so many, uh, there were so many of them. More of the dark, deadly creatures poured into Beacon with every passing hour, faster than they had could be destroyed. The monsters were stuff of nightmares, all shadow and bone and fire and fury. Uh, they only hunted humans and Faunus, such as Velvet. Okay, so that confirms that they do in fact hunt Faunus. Sorry, fat man. Uh, such as Velvet. And they were drawn to uh, negative emotions. They, fled off, uh, they fed off fear and anger and hatred. No one knew where Grimm came from or why they existed, uh, but they were killing machines. The only way to survive an attack by a Grimm was to kill it first. Velvet limped along, leaning against Yatsu, who wasn't in much better shape than she was. Still, his strong arm around her shoulders did more than keep her moving. It held up her spirit. Yatsu and the rest of her team made Velvet feel safe, even while they were facing the, great danger, uh, the greatest danger of their lives. But she also felt guilty. If Yatsu had taken care of her, uh, it kept him from saving other people who needed him more. So far, they had rescued seven frightened, uh, hurt tourists and citizens. That was weird. So far, they had rescued seven frightened, hurt tourists and citizens who were now following them uh, to the docks. But they were, uh, there were plenty more out there waiting for someone to help them. I'm fine, Velvet lied. Uh, she felt, uh, she felt as if she had been hit by a truck, which was close to the truth. We have to make sure everyone evacuates. An at lesion, uh, an at lesion, an at lesion paladin punched you, Yatsu said. We must get you to the docks. You need medical attention. Yatsu Hashi's right, Kyoko said. She paused to fire her gun at a Beowulf. The bullets did little more than annoy it, but still created enough of a distraction for Fox to sneak up behind and neatly slice off the Grimm's head. Fox walks through the, uh, walked through the black mist to jo uh, rejoin his team as the Grimm disappeared. Your aura is critical, Velvet, Coco continued. With her aura, the powerful protective life force tied to everyone's soul, at that low level, one more hit would finish her off. If it hadn't been for Weiss's semblance... Who knew she could do that? Uh, who knew she could do that, Yatsu hashed. Is it really the time to be talking about that? You, got, you guys got things to focus on. By that, he meant summon a massive sword with a giant ghostly hand to hold it from out of nowhere. It's a Schnee family thing, Fox said telepathically, somehow managing to, uh, to sound smug about it. They can summon avatars of enemies they've beaten to fight for them. Handy, huh? Is that just public knowledge? Kogo groaned. Uh, is it? Kogo groaned. The avatar Weiss had summoned had sliced up the, the war machine just before it would have finished vel off Velvet. What was even more impressive than the, uh, the life-saving stunt was the fact that Weiss had stepped between Velvet and the Paladin's killing blow without seeming uh, to know she could stop it. I think Weiss was just as surprised at what Vel was just as surprised at what Velvet's capable of. Coco smiled warily. "You were terrific." Thanks, Velvet said. In taking down the attacking military bots, she had finally had a chance to prove what she and her camera could do. Unfortunately, she had to burn through some of her best pictures using weapons she had uh, been saving all semester and losing photos of dear friends. Friends she suddenly wasn't sure she could uh, ever see alive or whole again in the process. Velvet knew that many Beacon students considered her dead weight on Team Coffee. But others didn't like her because they di uh, dis uh, discriminated against the faunus kind, people who possessed animal traits, and Velvet's rabbit ears uh, weren't so easily hidden by simple disguise. Uh, she had been hoping she would be chosen to fight in the vital tournament to show off a, li uh, a little for a change, but Koko had ended that idea pretty quickly. Velvet wondered if she and Yatsu would have done any better in the battle against Emerald and Mercury. Koko had wondered that too. She still smarted from that defeat. The bruise at her ego lasted longer than the bruise to her body. The bruises on her body. And now she had a new bruise on top of those, from fighting a seemingly endless onslaught of Grimm. The team was utterly spent. In the last hour, they had their friend Penny Paladina torn apart by... Were they friends with Penny? Oh, 
Okay. All right. Torn apart by her own weapons. They had helped take down a Nevermore at Amity Arena, fought Griffins and Ursai, faced off against Atlas's finest military machines, and still, um, and still there was no end in sight. That's weird. There's a period there. There shouldn't have been a period there. The Grim just kept coming. Uh, and now there were uh, there was a giant winged Grim circling Beacon Tower. The smart thing to do was retreat so they could fight another day. Heads up, Fox sent. Coco lowered her sunglasses. Two people were heading towards the school, away from the docks and away from safety. The girl in a white dress and a girl in a black dress with a red cloak. Weishni and Ruby rose. Every time Coco turned around, uh, one or more of the girls from Team Ruby was there, right in the middle of uh, the action. The first year students skidded to a stop in front of Team Coffee. Aren't you going the wrong way? Coco asked. Ruby pushed past the question. Has anyone seen John and Pira? Coco shook her head. The school's overrun with gl um, the school's overrun with Grim, Velvet said. They're still back there. If they're still back there, Why set her jaws. We're going to find them. Why should have stayed at the docks. It was obvious that she was running on empty, but she was still running. What about Blake? Yang? Did they make it? Velvet asks. Ruby closed her eyes briefly, swallowed uh, swallowed whatever she was going to say. She opened her eyes again, and they flashed in the moonlight. Is that okay? They're they're all the docks. We'll see you there soon with John and Pira. We'll help you look, Fox said. Are you crazy? Weiss cocked her head. You need to get Velvet out of here. I'll take Velvet, Coco tried. Uh, tried. Yatsuhashi and Fox will guard your flank. Then who will guard yours? Weiss gestured to the civilians who had been following uh, coffee. They looked uneasy about standing out in the open like this. Ruby unfolded her weapon uh, and used the sniper rifle to pick off a Beowulf approaching from their right. Don't split up your team, Coco. Coco struggled not to smart uh, against what sounded like an order coming from their friends. She'd never seen such a somber look in Ruby's eyes before. Chaos ruled in the ruined city, but just for a moment, the two team leaders calmly regarded each other. We have to stick together now more than ever, Ruby said. Coco nodded. Then Weiss and Ruby took off again. Ruby! Velvet called. Ruby turned back one last time, her, co uh, her cloak billowing in the bitter wind as the shaft of her sc a scythe dipped uh, down over her shoulder. Uh, Velvet's camera flashed as it snapped a, uh, snapped a photo. Be safe. Um, be safe. You too. Ruby collapsed uh, Crescent Rose and disappeared into the smoke? Wait. When did she turn her weapon into a scythe? She, she had it in sniper rifle ro mode. I guess she didn't actually have it in sniper mode? Weird. And she posed? Okay, that's great. Uh, we should have gone with them, Fox sent. Coco considered. Uh, Coco considered. They're the best two for the job. And we've got our own job. Getting these people out of Beacon. Making sure Velvet is alright. Velvet flicked past the photo of Ruby, pushing the way, uh, away the thought uh, that it could be the last photo she'd ever have of her friend. While Velvet's injuries were being treated at the docks, Ruby's Uncle Crow had arrived with, her, uh, with an unconscious Ruby and whisked her onto the next airbus. Velvet never saw them. Never even, Velvet never even saw them. Team Ruby hadn't returned after the fall of Beacon, and no one knew exactly where Ruby, Weiss, Blake, and Yang were now. What do you mean? So, so Weiss's semblance is public knowledge, but the fact that she returned to Atlas wasn't. All right. Um, you know, Yang went home. Velvet settled on one of her favorite weapons, Sharp Retribution, Fox's bladed tonfas. She was about to activate them and leap into the fray when she heard a dry, whispery voice nearby. So as often as she might have imagined it. Help! Velvet whipped around and scanned the area until she noticed uh, sand sliding down uh, a small hill. She shielded her eyes from the sun and squinted. Something was peeking out of the sand. It looked like the corner of a wagon. And her uh, then fingers broke through, frantically pushing some more sand away. Over here, the voice rasped. Rasped the voice. Semantics. So that's why the mole crabs were hanging out in the area, Velvet thought. The ground rubbled more, uh, and more sand fell away. Velvet turned and the source. Velvet turned and saw the source. 
A huge mound of sand was moving towards them, like Pumpkin Pete tunneling under the ground uh, in the, uh, the old cartoons. Something told her that it wasn't going to be an animated bunny. She glanced back at her teammates. Coco was still in one piece, trapped in uh, the crab's claws. Uh, Fox was on the monster's back, chipping away at the shell with his blades as the crab tried to burrow into the sand. Yatsu had changed tactics and was holding on one of the crab legs to keep it from submerging in the sand with Coco. They'll be fine for now, and besides, we don't have the, uh, we don't leave you all behind. Not anymore. Velvet summoned a hard light replicas of Fox's weapons and recalled Fox's fighting style as she ran past her friends towards the buried wagon. Oh, Velvet, where are you going? Fox sent. Could use a little help here. It was hard to pretend you didn't hear someone when they spoke in your head. Be right there, Velvet said. I hope. Uh, that was mental, by the way. Uh, she ran alongside the tunneling mole crab, struggling to keep up with it. It was hard enough to run on sand without its sur the surface uh, swelling and swirling in the creature's wake. Then the front half of the monster burst from the desert. So they do get bigger, she thought. Uh, if those other crabs were babies, this could be their parent, easily three times their size and three times as angry. Velvet pushed herself to go faster, cutting ahead of the crab as it, um, cutting ahead of the crab as it, for, as its forward end dropped to the ground, practically on top of her. She looked up and saw the claws preparing to grab her. Velvet quickly dove forward onto her hands and then pushed off the back. Her feet slammed against the bottom of the crab, and she fired bullets from the tonfa blades into the forearms away from it. Her momentum and the recoil from the gunshot blast carried her and the crab back off, off the ground. When she kicked off the creature's underside, it tipped up onto its rear legs, while Velvet landed clumsily on, it, on her hands and knees. The giant mole crab balanced precariously above her, waving its claws almost comically. Velvet gave herself a running start and launched herself at it again, this time face first. As she flew through the air, she twisted her body into a corkscrew and locked the arm blades forward, all while shooting at the crab's soft belly. The bullet started, uh, started the job, and the spinning, bladed, uh, the spinning blades finished it, uh, spewing briny fluid and guts everywhere. Everywhere. The crab's shrieks sent Velvet's teeth on edge. It fell backwards, already dead by the time it hit the ground. Velvet felt the body's, trem uh, felt the body's tremors as, it's as she climbed out of the hot, gory mess she had made of its belly, trying not to gag on such an awful stench. The hard light, uh, the hard light arm blades faded away. She jumped up the carcass and, uh, and surfed down the, uh, the crest of sand, skidding to a halt in front of the now half-exposed wagon. Velvet knelt in the sand, coughing and trying to catch her breath. Yatsuhashi was the first to reach her. Uh, you okay? He covered his nose and mouth. Why didn't you wait for us? Couldn't, Velvet coughed. She gestured urgently towards the wagon. Oh. Yatsu strode forward and grabbed the front of the wagon and heaved. Uh, he grunted and grimaced, straining and sinking into his ankles, uh, sinking, uh, and sinking to his ankles in the sand, then up to his knees. But the wagon slowly slid free, uh, slid free of the ground. When he held it aloft, sand streamed out of it into the open, uh, cab uh, out of the open cabin and wheels. Uh, she, he carefully righted the wagon and eased it down. Coco and Fox arrived. Velvet glanced back and saw her teammates had cracked uh, the other crab open like a nut. Fox put a hand on Velvet's shoulder. She nodded. I'm fine, but I could use a bath. He wrinkled his nose. Hello? Anyone there? Coco called. Here. Here. An older woman with spiky gray hair and leathery face poked out of their wagon. Thanks for the rescue. Yatsu uh, helped her down gently. She was stocky and short, half a foot shorter than Coco, but she looked rugged uh, like most uh, vacuum nomads. The woman cradled uh, her left arm, which looked to be dislocated at the shoulder. And who might you be? She asked. Uh, we're Shade Academy's newest pa oh, sorry, uh, this is we're Shade Academy's newest star pupils. Team Coffee. I'm Coco, and that's Fox, Velvet, and Yatsuhashi. Coco pointed out her teammates. Slate, nice to meet you all. The woman ran her fingers through her hair, sending sun drifting to her shoulders. Velvet realized that her hair was a uh, was a light brown, not gray. Uh, how long have you been out here? Coco asked. A day or two, maybe. Uh, a day or maybe uh, a day, maybe two. 
I gotta get used to these voices, man. Uh, Velvet handed the woman a canteen and she sipped the water slowly. We were fleeing the Gorsen settlement after a grim invasion. Just when we thought we were in the clear, we found this oasis that dried up and those crabs had moved in. Your family just abandoned you here? Velvet asked. Slate shook her head. No family. Not for a long, uh, not for a long time. What about the other survivors? Um, what about the other survivors then? Yatsuhashi asked. They survived, I hope. I can't, uh, I can tell you I knew here. Slate looked them over, taking their outfits. Most, I, I just went for Cockney. I don't know what I was thinking. Most vacuums wore simple light clothing tunics and uh, linen cloaks and head coverings uh, for crossing the desert. But Team Coffee had to, uh, had to strike a balance between staying cool and being combat ready. And their clothes were a reminder of where they had come from uh, and who they were. Something normal in their lives when everything was very much not normal. Besides, Coco would always choose fashion over sensibility at the drop of a, uh, of her a beret. Surviving, uh, surviving is what we do here. Oh, don't. Slate went on. We look out for one another, but if it's down to your life or someone else's, you choose your own. No hard feelings. You really believe that? Velvet asks. Slate shrugged and then winced. Uh, uh, Slate shrugged, then winced and grabbed her shoulder. What I believe is my own business, but if you're smart, you'll eat that advice. At any rate, the survivors fled and I couldn't leave the wagon. When I took a, even a step, the crabs woke up. They use vibration to find prey, but they lose interest in the moment you stop moving. You couldn't have, men oh, you couldn't have mentioned that? Yatsu glared at Fox. Where's the challenge in tiptoeing around our enemies? Fox said. Fortunately, um... Uh, Fortunately, I have this broken wagon, Slate went on. I stay with it in hopes for the best. That's us, Coco said. The best have arrived. God damn, Coco is fucking pompous. Um, and I'm glad for that. Didn't want anyone else dying on my account. But if someone was going to show up and destroy those crabs, I'm glad it was huntsmen like you. We did more than distract them, Fox said. Velvet still couldn't believe that Slate's friends had left her to die in the desert. If that was the way, uh, the way of life out here, that was one more thing to dislike about Vacuo. I wish we hadn't come here, Velvet thought. Not for the first time. Probably not for the last. How many more chapters? How long is this chapter? It's a prologue. Uh, flashback. Professor Port had ordered a mandatory evacuation of a safe zone northwest of the city, and General Ironwood had made it clear that there was no shame in leaving. You have two choices, he had said to the students of Amity Arena. Defend your kingdom and your school, or save yourselves. For Team Coffee, there was no question. They were going to stay in Beacon as long as they could. There were still defenseless people trapped and hiding throughout the city, and a steady flow of grim to this uh, the dispatch. The only question was whether Velvet uh, would stay with them or go safe, uh, go to safety on her own. They stood in front of the last transport ship while they debated. I'm already way better, Velvet said, uh, and the on-site medics had patched her up. Her muscles were still on fire, her body felt like giant, a giant bruise, and her head was throbbing, but she was, tough and she, uh, she was tougher than she looked. Tougher than anyone gave her credit for, even her own team apparently. I'll be back to Noma after a good night's sleep, Velvet said. Which you aren't likely to get uh, to get here fighting Grim, Coco said. Go, Velvet. You can rejoin us after you've rested up. We'll still be here. Velvet crossed her arms, recalling Ruby's parting words to them. Don't split up your team, Coco. Yatsu nodded. He wanted Velvet to be safe as much as anyone, but he figured the safest place for her was close uh, to him. And he certainly didn't want to miss out on the grim bashing, the grim bashing action at uh, Beacon. We won't be a team if you're dead. Velvet looked hurt. You don't think I can hold my own? You're injured. Coco held uh, held up a hand before Velvet could protest again, and you used up all your best photos. Uh, Velvet whipped out her camera and snapped a photo of Coco. Coco lowered her sunglasses. Cute. Velvet stuck her tongue out. But you know what I mean, Coco said. 
Hey, we're going... Uh, hey, we're going to have to get going. They're going to close the airspace soon, the Airbus pilot called. Give us a minute, flyboy, Coco snapped. Coco, Fox said. Coco looked at him. They did, uh, they each did. Fox spoke aloud only when they were in mixed company, or when he really wanted people to listen. But that was, uh, that was all a gentle admonishment to their leader. Coco sighed. I'm tired, not thinking clearly. That's the first sensible thing you've said all, um, oh. That's the first sensible thing you've said all day, Professor Glinda Govich strode towards them. Port told me you were insisting on staying. I'm here to convince you otherwise. Coco straightened. With all due respect, Professor, if you're staying, so are we. Glinda hid a smile. Is that so? We're students, but we're uh, we're students, but we're we're still huntsmen, Yatsu said. Huntsmen in training, Glinda said. She looked back at the fallen school wistfully. Huntsmen don't run, Coco said, even in training. We're sworn to defend those who can't protect themselves, and this is our home. Velvet said. I assume there will be some sort of extra credit for staying, Fox sent. Glinda studied each one of them, no longer trying to hide her smile or pride in them. Team Coffee, all of the students who had finished, uh, who had defended Beacon uh, this day, were a testament to what Beacon stood for. They were every bit the shining inspiration, the source of light in a world filled with darkness that Professor Osman had hoped they would be. He had stalked his, staked his reputation on his ideals, uh, put his life on the line countless times to uphold them. Uh, and if he had given his life in the end, as it seems he had, it was even more important for his trusted followers to pick up where he left off. Glinda could uh, certainly use all the help she could to get this, uh, keep the peace while she rebuilt the school, brick by brick if she had to. Uh, Velvet, go to the medics. See if they can find uh, you a bed to rest in, Coco said, taking her cue from the professor. We'll come back and get you at, uh, at dawn for another sweep of the city. What are you kids that own you anyway? Slate asked when Coco noticed uh, Coco's frown. He's cutting back to the future. Uh, da -da -da. She held up a hand as he, uh, uh, when she noticed Coco frown, she held up a hand. Everyone's a kid to me. Don't mean nothing by it. Uh, Shade Academy had received a, a distress call from, Goss, uh, from Gossen. Professor Rumpel sent us to help. Coco, uh, Coco said. From Gossin, Slate said. We haven't been able to talk to Shade since the CCT went down. The cross Cantonato transmit system had been offline since the attack at, on Beacon Ca Tower, which also housed Vale's CCT Tower, cutting off communications among the kingdoms to Remnant. Wireless communications still worked within Vacuo thanks to the support towers relaying signals across the continent. Uh, but it was spotty farther away from CCT, the towers... Um, it was spotty farther away from the CCT tower at the academy. Sandstorms also tended to uh, cause interruptions, and the smaller town, uh, the smaller towners were often lost to Grim, further breaking down the network. Uh, we thank someone. Uh, we thank someone with a hard wire directly into the Golden Support Tower, which boosted the signal strength enough to reach us. Velvet said. Must been someone clever then. Did you get a name? Slate asked. Coco shook her head. The transmission was a faint one. Uh, the transmission was a faint one. We heard Gawson was under attack and the survivors were going for Feldspar. Feldspar. We were on our way there before all this. Coco swept her hand out. That was the plan, Slate said. Feldspar is the closest big settlement. It has a small oasis and another CCT support tower. Good, then we should uh, be able to report back to our Professor Rumpel and update her on her status, Coco said. My status is hot, tired, and hungry, Yatsu said. You forgot smelly, Fox said. Ooh, burn! Wow, the wit here is just exceptional. Uh, I'm trying to ignore that, Yatsu said, and failing. Uh, when we get to Feldspot, you can probably take the most of those problems, at least... Uh, we can probably take care of most of those problems, at least temporarily, Slate said. Then let's get you to your new home, Velvet said. Slate smiled tightly. Uh, the only home you have in Vacuo is the people you keep close. Don't forget that. 
We'll get your uh, we'll get you back to your people then, Coco said. The ones who abandoned you, Velvet thought. Some home. One moment. One moment. Slate climbed back into her wagon. A moment later, she emerged with a large canvas pack on her back. A sturdy walking stick and a big scary knife. What's that for? Yatsu asked, eyeing the knife. What do you think? This is one of the most inhospitable places we've ever seen in Remnant. What the frack do you think this is a for, Yatsu? Slate just the giant crabs baking in the desert around them, already being covered by the drifting sand. Unlike the Grim, when you kill an ordinary animal... So they are ordinary animals. Okay, so we have interesting new wildlife for Remnant. Got it. Unlike the Remnant, uh, unlike Grim, when you kill an ordinary animal, even uh, one of unusual size, it left a body behind. I can't like... Uh, we can't let good food go to waste. Slate said. Food? Velvet covered her mouth and tried not to gag. You're kidding, Coco said. Mole crab is a rare delicacy, Fox sent. Uh, rare because those, uh... Rare because those who hunt, uh, who hunt the mole crab usually end up feeding the mole crab. But the five of them were no match for you, Slate laughed. We'll just scoop the meat out of the shell and pack it in sand and we'll be heroes in Feldspar. There are a lot of mouths to feed, at least I hope there are. Velvet felt sick. I'd rather fight another crab than eat one. If we take much longer here, you might get your chance, Coco said. Come on, team. Let's head. Uh, let's help, but make it quick. The sooner we finish, the sooner we'll be at Feldspar. I don't know how safe we'll be, Slate said. Something odd's been going on. What do you mean, Coco asked. Let's just say we aren't one big happy family lately. Not anymore, but there's a time for that later. I'm taking the big one. Looks like she might be carrying egg sacks. Slate scampered off towards the uh, dead mother crab and then carved out a hefty chunk of meat. Gross, Velvet said. Dibs on the legs, Fox shouted as he ran off after Slate, arms blades out. Even after all the time we've known each other, sometimes Fox is a complete mystery to me, Coco said as she watched him hack off a giant crab leg. I didn't figure him for a leg guy. All right, that's a good one. Uh, he's different. He's different than we, uh, since we got here. Yatsu said, "Vacuo was his home." If it's his home, then why did he leave? Velvet asked. But there was another unanswered question. Uh, she'd much rather be asking, "Why did we have to leave Beacon?" All right, I'm gonna pause there briefly. Uh, take a brief intermission so I can use the restroom. We are now on chapter one, which has a silhouette of Coco. If you can see, yep. All right. Be right back and use the restroom. Mm -hmm. Esther one. There we go. I put that on. Ah, hello, welcome back. Sorry, didn't mean to take so long there. So 
Sorry it takes so long, folks. So uh, let's read. So what was it? So what would it persuade you to read this honored books? I mean, you could always commission me. Um, uh, but I don't know exactly what price would be for that. That's that's a pretty hefty project to go into. Um, I'm interested in them from the get-go, but I don't know if I would do it anytime soon. So that's the question that Sentryon asked a little while back, about 41 minutes ago. Oh, it's been already almost an hour. Oh, my God. I'm only, what, how many pages in? This is reading really slow. I might only get, I might only match up 60 pages. I guess maybe, maybe it's not quite as well spaced as I thought. Maybe it's just because it's bigger in certain ways. Okay. Well, let's get back to it. <clears throat> Chapter 1. Coco stayed back until her team and Slate entered the, uh, the makeshift walls of the Feldspar settlement. She lowered her sunglasses and took one last survey of the sweeping desert landscape behind them. It was just past twilight, and the full moon hung low over the horizon, giving the sand a silvery glow. It was actually kind of pretty, but dangerous, uh, but dangerous things often were. Coco wasn't sure if the moving shadows in the distance were wildlife lurking grim or the desert sand shifting in the starlight. Coco had learned that the sand was in constant motion, but even Fox didn't know exactly where or why or how. For instance, their trail, only, uh, only a few minutes old, was already disappearing. Vacuo seemed like a good place to go if you didn't want to be followed, if you want to disappear yourself. It also was a good place to go to die unless you were uh, strong enough to survive the extreme temperatures, and even then, uh, in even more extreme dangers. Uh. Coco pushed up her glasses and rejoined the others, shaking off her apprehension about what might be out there. There was always something out there. She relaxed slightly, not that she uh, would let anyone notice, now that Velvet Fox and Yatuhashi were safe inside the nomadic settlement. Oh, I guess the outlines of the characters might be the, the point of view we're seeing, so that's, that, that could be interesting. Um, of course, safe and inside were relative terms. She realized that she took uh, in the makeshift village. Coco's dark glasses made her seem uh, casual and aloof, but that couldn't have been farther from the truth. Uh, her whole appearance was carefully cultivated to give her an edge over opponents and classmates alike, while, of course, looking fashionable. She liked that her glasses hid uh, where her attention was and that she was think uh, and what she was thinking until she wanted someone to know. Plus, it looked damn good on her, though didn't everything. But underneath all that fashion, Coco was studying everything around her, silently sizing up everyone, sometimes not so silently, and Feldspar was a dump. The so-called settlement consisted of scattered tents, trucks, vans, and uh, squat ab adobe homes haphazardly arranged without any visible defenses. There was no way it could ever compare to Beacon, let alone any village in Vale. There, was even, there wasn't even a lookout tower or any sign of guards patrolling. Well, that was what huntsmen were for, right? That was why Team Coffee was there. Coco nodded. She always felt uh, better when there was a job to do. Then it hit her. That, uh, what was what was so odd about Feldspar? A moment later, Fox's thoughts echoed to her own. Where is everyone? Everybody, Fox asked. The sand was smooth and packed down to the collective weight of people walking over all day, every day, for months, but fresh footsteps were visible, suggesting that people had been here recently and cleared out in a hurry. Coco helped, uh, held up a hand and uh, looked around. Fox, Yatsuhashi, and Velvet nodded uh, at the familiar signal to stop and listen. They froze. Then, in the still night, they heard a slight rustle of, cloth of clothing, gentle breathing. They're all around us, Fox sent to his team. Coco caught Slate's eye and moved her hand in circles. Here we go, Coco thought. Come out, folks, Slate uh, called out. These are, my, uh, these are my friends. I can vouch for them. They're the huntsmen, uh, and the huntsmen to boot. Good ones! They waited. Slate raised a walking stick. Slate! An excited male voice called out. And in a blink, the courtyard was bustling with people, swarming towards Slate. You're alive, you, so, uh, you old so-and-so. A tall man with dusty hair, dusty skin, and dusty clothes grabbed Slate in a bear hug. You see, I missed a chance for a good line there. You could have said, Dusty hair, dusty skin, and dusty clothes grabbed Slate in a bear hug. Maybe everything here was just dusty. That would have been a fun line. 
She seems popular, Fox sent. So why'd they leave her? Velvet asked. Wait, can she... Is it a two-way communication, Fox's semblance? Why is it italicized? Past put me down or that situation might change, Slate said in a strained voice. I'll put you down on the condition you never pull a stunt like that again, Bass said with a laugh. I'll give him a scone egg tonight to go with that. Oh. You know I don't like conditions, Slate said, and I break promises like I break wind. Sometimes you just can't help it. Slate. Bass rolled his eyes and then lowered her gently. You certainly have a way with words. But everyone does it. Which, breaking win or breaking promises? Both! And it's polite to not to call either of them out when it happens. Slate uh, patted the dusty man affectionately on his broad arm. How'd we do? Everyone got away, thanks to you, Bass said. Coco narrowed her eyes behind her glasses. Why do I get the feeling there's something you aren't telling us? Ugh. I know, I hate sand. I love the beach. I hate sand. It's so annoying to walk it, and you just get always in your shoes. Ugh. Bass turned to Coco and appraised her and the rest of the group quickly. He seemed to make a snap judgment that they were worth talking to. Uh, that was the way, all, uh, way of all vacuans. The fact that they had clearly just survived the fight and were bringing back the spoils, as well as one of their own people, likely spoke in Team Coffee's favor. Slate here saved a lot of us. Again. Slate saved a lot of us again, Bass said. Alabaster? Slate said sharply. She never wants any credit for keeping us alive, but you should have seen her. She held up that pot of sand crabs while the rest of us escaped. We got worried when she didn't catch up to us, though. Just doing my job, Slate said. Are you a huntress, Slate? Velvet asked excitedly. She's better. She's our mayor. Coco's eyes widened. It wasn't every day that someone surprised uh, that someone surprised her. I didn't think nomadic settlements had mares, Coco said. Every group needs a leader, Fox said. Especially when the group settles down for a while. We need someone who doesn't get uh, complacent, who keeps everyone ready to move at a moment's notice. That person doesn't get away uh, with a formal thought. You have been in vacuo for a year and you don't know that roaming settlements have mares. How is it? This guy is a competent writer. There's some really, there's some decent descriptions in here and some good characterization, and he's falling prey to some, some, some basic issues that I don't. I, Ruby's bad writing has followed him into this. Uh, we need someone who doesn't get complacent, who keeps everyone ready to move at a moment's notice. That person doesn't always get a formal title. Titles are meaningless anyway. Slate turned her attention to Fox. You're from here. Who's your tribe? I'm from Ken... Uh, Ken T. Ken Yeti. I'm from Ken Yeti. Fox said. But it's been a long time. No matter how long you've been away, you're part of your tribe. Uh, your tribe's always a part of you. I've lost her accent completely. Uh, Slate said. Fox, sm Fox smiled. Kente, uh, I'll just say Kente. Kente is a great distance, uh, Kente is a great distance from here, but alas, I heard they're thriving. Yeah, she's going more Scottish now, Slate said. I'm saying, she's not actually saying these things, yeah. Uh, as well as anyone can in the desert, Bla uh, Bass added. Slate, so you were mayor of Gossen? Coco asked. It doesn't matter anymore. Uh, Slate said. She wasn't playing at being humble or feigning discomfort. She really didn't want the attention. Uh, Slate is made of tough. That was the name of our original settlement, but, uh, and, and it's what we call ourselves, Bass explained. Wherever we go, wherever we settle, we call that place by, uh, by our name. Unless we join permanently with another tribe of nomads. We've had to move a few times now. Grim. They always seem to find us, but more quickly lately. Something strange has been going on. Like I said, just doing my job. A job no one else wants. Including me. I'm glad you're back, Slate. 
Bass lowered his voice. Like Gulson, Feldspar has a weak leadership. Has a weak leadership. They'll be happy to have you. <clears throat> How long is this chapter, I wonder? Just so I get an eye, eye, eyeball for it. No, oh, it's not that long. It's not. 39? Oh, I can, that's 11 pages. Coco looked around, and it was impolite to tell apart the reason... Um, it was impossible to tell apart the recent Gossen refugees from the Feldspar tribe. Many of them were slightly less rumpled and dirty than the others, but that could have just been a matter of personal hygiene. See, that's good. That's interesting stuff. That's that's good writing. And there's the bad writing. That's It's weird. Uh, the politics here can get interesting. Like I said, most tribes and settlements don't have elected officials, Fox sent. As a general rule, uh, we don't like rules. It's even more unusual for a tribe to have a leader that they uh, trust uh, and like especially after they uh, contacted, connected with a large group. Slate must be really good. Uh, well, how good's the novel? Well, I've lost 34 viewers so far, to tell you something. I doubt they elected her, but it sounds like no one else wants to, uh, was in the running, Coco said. Slate seemed like the kind of person who stepped up when she had to, and most people are naturally inclined to be followers. Speaking of jobs... The slate said. Where are Bartolek and Carmine? They're supposed to be fighting those Grimm. Coco raised her eyes. There were other huntsmen here? Slate shrugged. Sort of. I'll find them. Bast ran off. Slate called out to a few boys at the edge of the crowd. Hans, why don't you get your friend uh you and your friends make yourselves useful? This here is a fresh sand crab. Take it to the mess and make sure it gets rationed. You three take an extra share for your trouble. One boy with dirt smudged face nodded. You got it, Mr. Slate. It's just, uh, you got it, Miss. Oh, this is, that was Slate talking. Oops. Hans, why don't you make sure your friends make yourself useful? This is fresh sand crab. Take it to the mess and make sure you get rationed. Take three, uh, three shares for yourself for your troubles. One boy with a dirty smudged face said, You got it, Miss Slate. It's just Slate, kid. Hans and his two friends grabbed the cloth wrap uh, bundles of crab meat from Yatuhashi and Fox. Why didn't you mention you sacrificed yourself to save your people, Velvet asked Slate. Slate gave her a uh, penetrating look. We have changed anything. It didn't seem relevant. You were just as eager to save me when I was some defenseless old woman, which thanks to you again, by the way. Fortunately, I didn't end up dying after all this. This time... Slate crossed her arm and looked around. These aren't my people either. They're just people. Good people. And I believe in helping others when I can. I don't quite... Uh, I don't care who they are or where they're from. There we go. I'm getting her accent back. She's incredible, Coco thought. She saw why everyone rallied to Slate. And it still isn't just because she helped organize and protect them. It was because she cared more about them than she did herself. And that was a rare quality in Vacuo. As Slate herself had implied... Back in the desert, it was the kind of quality that eventually got you killed, unless you were also very lucky or very strong. Why don't we go to the saloon for a drink and some of that food we brought back? Coco hid a smile. Slate was deft at making an order seem like more of a friendly suggestion. It didn't really seem like an order. Slate led them to uh, a one-level hut uh, from a sandstone canvas. Uh led them to a one-level hut built from a sandstone uh, from sandstone canvas and good intentions. It was remarkably spacious and clean inside, and pleasantly warm. The night was gradually getting uh, colder, as it did after the sun went down in vacuo, but the saloon had a number of roaring uh, fire pits. The laughter, conversation, and music stopped uh, when people spotted Slate. <clears throat> Uh, she smiled and waved. Can't get rid of me that easily. Several people called out well wishes to her and, or banged their clay mugs against the, t uh, the long shell tables. Coco thought Slate would uh, pick at a table in the corner for some privacy, but she walked right into, uh, up to the one in the corner uh, in the center. Cobby followed her and sat down. The rest of the restaurant soon went back to their business as if they weren't there. Coco figured it was naive to think they were really being ignored. Though the people in Vacuo didn't trust strangers easily, and coffee, um, 
sorry, I read that wrong. Coco figured it was naive to think they were being ignored. Uh, being ignored, though. People in Vacuo didn't trust strangers easily, and coffee had a way of attracting attention when they, uh, wherever they went. A pretty faunus waitress with uh, a pig snout came over. That's got to look weird. I, I want to see that animated. Uh, a perky faunus waitress with a pig snout came over. She rounded off the offerings. Today's specials are... Oh. Today's specials are crab, uh, crab burgers, crab steak, crab cake, and crab rangoon. All very fresh. Oh, man. I haven't eaten all day. I could go for some crab rangoon. You know what? I might go out and get some rangoon. I don't know if I can find some. This one's on me, Slate said. I'm going to need an ale, Topaz. Make it two to start and keep them coming. As much as I love crab anything, I've been dreaming about your spicy pat stew for days. Got any of that left? For you, anything. I know I'm probably being horribly racist to the faunus, but I'm going to I'm going with it. I hope she doesn't become a regular Oh god, she has a lot of li lines. Why? Okay, maybe I'm not going with that for her. That's a bad idea. <clears throat> and get these folks whatever they like. They earned it. Coffee, Coco said. She madly needed a caffeine, and she also liked uh, to stay on brand. And I'll try the crab burger. What in vacuo? Yatsuhashi ordered the crab steak and uh, d uh, desert lotus tea, and Fox ordered uh, fried crevice worm, lightly toasted cave beetles, and water. Cactus tea, Velvet said. And the gecko cake, please. Uh, you know it isn't really cake, right? Coco smiled. Velvet sighed. I'll get those orders right. A tall, broad uh, man in a green mohawk and matching goatee shoved Topaz aside. Coco registered the mace on his belt before she uh, took in the rest of him. A brown hooded cloak made of uh, coarse fabric was draped at his broad shoulders. He wore a green chest plate over his dirty black tunic. His biceps bulged from the short sleeves, showing off a long scar stretching down his right forearm. Hey. Yatsuhashi rose and faced him. Uh, they were about the same height, but the newcomer ignored him. I guess it more... Hey! From Yatsuhashi there. Uh, meanwhile, Velvet was checking on Topaz. You okay? Velvet asked the waitress. Topaz nodded. She was shaking, but fine. Better like apologize to the girl, Slate said. I'm sorry you were in my way, Bertolick growled. Now run along, piggy. Oh my god, people! Finally! After six volumes! And a book! And a game! Multiple games! Racism! Actual dyed-in-the-wall racism! Oh, lord, it took you long enough! It also is the most stereotypical racism. It's actually not the good kind, but you know what? I'll take it. Also, saying that and exam I'm ooh, lightheaded all of a sudden. Mm. <sighs> okay. <clears throat> See, I'm sorry you were in my way, Bertolick growled. Now run along, piggy. Fox frowned and fingered the tip of one of his arm blades. I apologize, Slate said to Topaz. Topaz put a hand on Slate's shoulder and then left, uh, casting a scornful look at Bertolick behind his back. Well, well, what do we have here? Bertolick uh, stuck a toothpick in his mouth. Not every day you see new huntsmen in these parts. Nice to see you too, uh, Slate said. You've gotten comfortable in Feldspar already, I see. You're tougher than you look. I'm surprised you're alive, Bertolick said. Now thanks to you, Slate said. Everyone got here just fine, Bertolick said. Slate said, then Bertolick said, Bertolick said, then Slate said. Vary it up a bit. Well, thanks for that much, then. We didn't do it for you. Thanks for being crab bait, he laughed. Bertolic Celadon, 
Uh, for next Celadon, this is Coco, Velvet, Fox, and Yatsuhashi. Team Coffee from Shade Academy. Team Coffee, huh? So you're Huntsman training. Bertilic's face registered surprise, and something else Coco couldn't place. Annoyance? You attended Shade too, didn't you? You're a Huntsman? Coco asked incredulous. Sometimes it's even hard for me to believe. A woman walked up, um, oh. Sometimes it's even hard for me to believe. A woman walked up and stood next to Bertilic. Unlike her partner, she was clearly a huntress. And she was stunning. Oh god, I'm go I've am i read the description before. This is gonna be fun. Another ben uh, benefit of wearing sunglasses was people couldn't tell when you were staring. And Coco couldn't take her eyes uh, off the fit, dark-skinned uh, woman. Tinted goggles were perched upon her head. And her wild, unbound scarlet hair... Uh, reached just past her waist. Freckles dotted her nose and cheeks. Streaks of silver, uh, a streak of silver hair parting uh, her left temple, shown uh, parting at her left temple, shone in the firelight, mirroring the short silver cape draped at her right side. A chain mail crop top. <laughs> a chain mail crop top exposed her midriff. And she completed the ensemble with a black belt, red mini shorts, and thigh-high black boots. Holstered on her belt held a pair of long sigh. Bertilakia barely graduated, the huntress said. Theodore had it in for me, Bertilak said. Only because you couldn't follow the rules. I apologize for anything off-color my partner says. If he hasn't offended you yet, trust me, he will. I'm Coco Adele. Coco rose and extended a hand. Carmen Escalados. Escalados. She shook Coco's hand firmly, each of them applying uh, just enough pressure to let the other woman know she was she was holding back. You have to tell me where you shop, Coco said. I love your outfit. It's one of the most ridiculous outfits I have ever, ever had conceived. This old thing? I've had it forever. Picked it up in Mistral years ago. I want your purse. Who's the designer? Coco Adele, Coco said. Made it yourself? You must be one of a kind. Careful, I might have to take it from you, Carmine winked. And then she nodded at Velvet, Natsu uh, Yatsuhashi and Fox. So you guys just passing through? Oh yeah, by the way, I'm getting serious villain vibes from her. Just saying. Water burps. Gotta love them. <clears throat> Coco shook her head. Someone called Shade um, asking for help, so Professor Rump uh, Rumpel sent us. Who called? Bertilick stared at Slate. It's a great mystery, Slate said. And not the only one around here. Well, I want... Bertilick began, but uh, Carmine interrupted him with an elbow jab. We're going to have some backup, of course, Carmine said. Oh, we're glad to have some backup, of course, Carmine said. We've had our hands full. It's strange for someone to send a distress call when there are already huntsmen around, Velvet said. We didn't hire Bertilek and Carmine, Slate said. They just assist us on occasion, when they feel like it. Lucky that you two happen to be close by, Coco said. What brought you the vacuo? That's none of your business, uh... Oh, sorry. Luckily, you two uh, happen to be close by, Coco said. What brought you to Vacuo? That's none of your business, sweetheart. Uh, Bertilek moved his toothpick to the other side of his mouth. We'll be moving on pretty soon, Carmine said. The sooner the better, Bertilek said. I want to get out of here before things heat up again. Are you expecting trouble? Velvet asked. Always, oh darling. Velvet crossed her arms and turned towards Slate. Trouble's been following us around. Every few days, something uh, gets people here worked up for no reason. Arguments and fights break out, people get afraid, and of course, all that negative emotion brings grim. More of them, uh, more and more of them every time. How long has this been going on, Coco asked. About a month. Half of the folks uh, here have survived three separate attacks as, uh, at as many settlements. Slate counted them off. 
Tuft, Schist, now Gossen. Uh, we've got a lot of good people. Uh, we've lost a lot of good people along the way. Uh, would have been more if not for us. Cool it, Carmine said. Coco wiped her brow. It was getting a little toasty in her for uh, in her quarter uh, in, in the close quarters for the saloon. Topaz uh, brought over a tray of drink and food. She gave Berta like a wide berth as she unloaded the cups and plates on the table. Care to join us? Uh, Coco asked, looking at Carmine. I'll take a rain check, she said. And I don't mean it in the vacuum way. At Coco's puzzled expression, she explained, It rains so infrequently here, a rain check is kind of their version of when pigs fly. Hey, Topaz said with a hurt expression. No offense intended, Co uh, Carmine said. Wait, why would she be offended? It's literally like, like, she wouldn't be offended by that. Oh, wait. <laughs> she was offended by when pigs fly, not by the actual vacuum expression. I'm an idiot. <laughs> no offense intended. Hey. Uh, where are you from, Carmine? Originally, Atlas, because believe it or not, uh, Atlas, believe it or not, can you picture me in a uniform? Yes, Coco thought. Coco is gay. Coco is gay. Actually, this is this is fine. Uh, this, this so far hasn't been too bad on that. Uh, a lot has happened since I left. Uh, if you have time later, I'll gladly regale you with some hunting stories. But right now, I should check in on, on the Caspians. They're fine, Bertolick snarled. Did you forget we're on the clock? We work for them. Let's go, Carmine said pointedly. Good to meet you. Looking forward to getting to know you uh, to one another. Uh, getting to know one another. Coco sat down and sipped her coffee. It was scalding hot. They needed to turn down the heat in here. Oh, so she's getting hot and bothered. Like, I'm, I'm liking this. It's actually well written for this kind of stuff. Who are the Caspians? Coco asked when the other huntsmen had left. Edward Caspian and his gar uh, grandson, August. They seem nice, but they don't socialize much. Slate, uh, oh, they don't socialize much, Slate said. They're from a village called Sumire. Sumire? That's in Vale, Coco said. It's a long, dangerous journey even before you hit the desert. Team Coffee had experienced it for themselves when they had traveled from Beacon to Shade Academy on foot. You traveled on foot? Why? Why would you do that? Along the way, they had encountered an unusually high number of Grimm, which were being drawn to Beacon Tower. They had taken care of as many of them as they could, feeling like they were helping to defend their home even uh, when they were running from it. What brings in the vacuo? Coco asked. Where are they going? Fox asked. Slate shrugged. Got questions! They'd never answered them. The Caspians arrived in, uh, at Tuft with a uh, Bertolick and Carmine in pretty uh, rough shape, like they'd been running for days. We couldn't turn them away like that. By the time they were back on their feet, the Grim were at her gates. The four of them have stuck with us ever since. The group tucked, uh, tucked into their food. Yatsuhishi gingerly cut through his crab steak with a fork and knife, and the way he did everything when he wasn't wielding his greatsword on the battlefield. He was always afraid of damaging something or hurting someone with his strength. Nice touch. I like it. He took a bite and chewed it thoughtfully. Not bad. Could use some mistral spices. You think everything oh, you think everything could use some mistral spices, Velvet laughed. Coco thought the burger was maybe too spicy. Uh Slate took a bite of her bat stew, briefly closed her eyes, and sighed happily. I needed that. And this. She took a big gulp of ale from a frothy mug. She frowned. Ah, it's warm. She gestured to Topaz and turned back to Coco and the others. So you've run from Grim Attacks twice, Coco asked Slate. That's right. I got in the wild, uh, the wild race when we evacuated Tuft. Grim had been on our heels the whole way. I've never seen anything like it. Sometimes things get tense, sure, but that brings up a few stray Grim. Uh, but things always calm down, and life goes on. This is different. When emotions start to run high, it just gets worse and worse. And the Grim come, and they don't stop. So we run. We settle down somewhere, and we're pretty soon starts all over again. I don't know what uh, we'll do when those huntsmen leave the Caspians. 
We're here now, Coco said. I was just, uh, I was just, ho I was hoping you'd say that. I don't know, uh, who summoned you, but we can, uh, but we can't pay you. I'm sorry. Even if we took up a collection, it wouldn't be enough. Slate said. We barter for almost all of our business, and we, uh, we've all taken a big hit with the evacuations. Uh, Fox slurped fried worms into his mouth. We're doing this for school credit, he said, his mouth full. Uh, we're doing this for school credit, he said, his mouth full. Uh, and we'll help because it's the right thing to do, Velvet said. Yatsuhashi nodded, chewing. Uh, whatever the reason, uh, whatever the reason, we're here, Coco said. Maybe we can fight the Grim off with, uh, without needing to evacuate again. Maybe the Grim won't bother us this time, Topaz said. Coco hadn't even noticed the waitress returning to the table. Maybe! Slate handed her mug and ex uh, explained kindly that the ale should be served cold. The waitress looked confused. Coco realized that Topaz wasn't uh, the only one that had lingered near the table. A small crowd had gathered around them, the better to eavesdrop in their conversation. No such thing as privacy in vacuo, not when most of the walls were made of uh, adobe and canvas. And someone else's business usually affected your own. A crash came from the other side of the saloon, followed by the sound of plates breaking. Two people started yelling. Coco stood and saw two men circling the overturned uh, table, fists raised. It's already starting, Slate sighed. She carefully wiped her mouth uh, with a napkin and rose. This is what I get for, uh, was talking about. We'll get to the bottom of it, Coco said. Just try and keep everyone calm. Slate nodded and walked towards the impending fight. What can we do here anyway? Fox asked. We can start by learning more about what's been, uh, been happening here. There has to be a reason for the fights breaking out, Koku said. There you go again, making decisions for us, Velvet said. Excuse me? Velvet felt a surge of anger. I'm the boss. You're the leader, not the boss, Fox said. Whoa, Yatsuhashi said. Calm down, everyone. We're tired. I'm sorry. I don't know why I said that. I, I didn't mean it. Velvet took a piece of flatbread from Slate's plate and chewed it quietly. Anyway, clearly something is causing people to get emotional. Coco studied Velvet uh, and Fox. Where had that outburst come from? Oh, I'm glad you at least highlighted it. It was That was way too sudden not to be highlighted. Uh, uh, we could interview uh, the nomads. Yatsuhashi was also... We could interview the nomads. Yatsuhashi was also casting a worried eye on Velvet. It's a start, Coco said. As soon as we're done eating, I'll find the CCT relay tower and let Professor Rumpel know that we've made it and we'll be staying a few days. Uh, she sat back down to sip her co uh, cooling coffee and watched Slate work. When the bra uh, brawling men saw the mare coming close, they lowered their fists and looked deeply embarrassed. Slate talked to each of them softly. Uh, she took a deep breath and let it out, watching them... Uh, Watch as she as they mimicked her. Uh, then they uh, sh then they shook hands and picked the table uh, the shell table back up together. Slate looked uh, plenty tough to Coco. It was no wonder these nomads, even the strangers who had joined the group from other settlements ravaged by Grimm, looked to her as a leader. Like Slate, Coco couldn't uh, hadn't chosen to lead coffee uh, hadn't chosen to lead Team Coffee. She had been chosen. Sometimes she didn't know if that had been the right choice. In the beginning, she hadn't particularly wanted responsibility for her team, or now the no, uh, or now the nomads in Feldspar. She was just do, trying to do her job. Coco hoped she uh, she'd be successful uh, at it as Slate was one day. And you know, I think actually that's where I'm going to call it. I know I would say I was going about two hours, but I am starving, and the food in this has been making me so hungry. I actually really could go for some, like, crab rangoon or something like that. I'll have to scavenge something. Oh, God. That, and it's getting a little late, and I have one last Pepsi for the day. I don't want to don't wanna overclock myself. That said, so far, it's engrossing. It's not bad in that way. It's, 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 I'm, I'm interested. They, they've set up a good conflict right away. Um, I think you overdid it. The, the, um, Myers, you overdid it a little bit on, on dumping some of the plot, the, 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 the lore elements. Um, especially for newcomers, I think overall 
it's so far a decent addition. There's some of the writing issues I carried over, but I'll have to dissect whether it's Miles and Carrie's fault or if Myers dropped the ball on basically uh, basically bashing them. Uh, I still don't like the new two characters. I was going to say about the, the racist character, I do not... I do not like Berlitz, or whatever his name was. Ber uh, it was... Ah, uh, where's his name? Bertilac. What's his name? Bertilic. Um, Bertilic, like, I like him. I, I finally get a racist character, but again, it's the Cardin scenario where he's an unlikable douchebag. That's, that is the most dangerous kind of... Of racism, you can perfect. The type of racism that I think a lot of these things are primed to cover is subtlety. Subtle racism. You don't... Good people can be racist. Good people can be. And the fact is, it's actually making me question racism in Ruby even more because it seems like six out of the seven people in that conversation were against the racist. Actually, yeah, it was six out of seven. So it's like... Uh, we are 41 pages in the book and there's over 200 pages uh, there's the epilogue let me look at the epilogue's last page epilogue is 295 pages so we're roughly a seventh through the book so probably about seven streams if I keep at this pace. Hopefully I'll be better fed and better watered because I'm running out of water here. Um, so it's going to be a little longer than I thought it was. I'm just moving slower, I think, with my reading. I guess it's trying to give them all the different voices and such. It's. Do you guys like the voices? I, I have to wonder that. If you like the voices, let me know. If you don't like the voices, let me know. I want to know. Um... That said, I would like to cover some of the messages I got. I got a donation from Centrion. Do you think rebooting Ruby with a manga is a good idea? Rebooting Ruby with a better writer is a good idea. That's that's the best you can hope for, really. Um, but rebooting, I don't know how well that would take off. And I got a super chat from Anime as an Art that says, I told you on Twitter, stupid chainmail top. Her design is terrible. Her design is garbage. Carmine is such a bizarre character. Design-wise. Um, yeah, I, I, the thing is, I think that they're the ones drawing it. I think I know what it is. It's the Relic. Think about it. They established in Volume 6 that the Relics attract Grimm. Well, maybe they have the Relic and it's attracting Grimm. It's not just the unease affecting people. The relic could be affecting people too. We don't know. Maybe. It could be the relic. Uh, it could be the fact that maybe one of them has a like a negativity semblance of some sort. Um, the, um, I don't know. I don't know. This is, this is so far, I'm interested. I, I'm intrigued by where this is going to go. Next stream should be about Friday. I'm hoping it'll be Friday. Um, that's a tentative date. That's not a solid date. I should be able to do it then. I also know that there is a block where me and Fat Man, I think it is sixth. On the sixth, Tom is not going to be available for review. So we might stream it then. I could I could stream it with Fat Man's uh, 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 assistance. Uh, but until then, uh, oh, what's this? A good writer, since it would be easier to make it, since you don't have to worry about animation. That sort of stuff. I mean, even with a manga, you have to worry about art. Art intensity is still a thing. Every single medium has its own. Right? The only one you don't have to worry about is um, is strict writing. But even then, you have to worry about prose, which is a lot different. Um, which has its own pits and falls to a certain extent. Um, Ash Barton, uh, or Bergen, said, Reboot Ruby with a better writer, consistent fighting scenes in your epi uh, in episode format would make Ruby godlike. 
If I could get someone to fund me, I would totally reboot Ruby on the fly, but I don't have that kind of pull yet. But be sure to share this video around, subscribe to the channel, and ring that bell as well as activate YouTube notifications so you can get more notifications as to when I will stream, when I will be having videos released, and I will have more popularity as to garner more pull. And with that pull, I will be one step closer to rebooting Ruby with my revised story from Fixing Ruby. With that said, I would like to thank you all so much for watching. I'll uh, take... So I take fan submissions for that. Uh, there is a Fixing Ruby, adding flavor to remnant link, um, uh, moderated by moderately entertained. That's in all the Fixing Rubies. You can add that stuff there. But thank you all so much for watching, and I shall catch you all on the jolly good next episode of Let's Read Ruby Fall After the Fall. That's it. Yes, that's that is the title. Catch you all on the flip side. Tibio.